I'm Cece, everyone. You got my background from Anne. That was very kind of her. Um, and I can give you a little more context on myself really quick. So I've worked at these places. I've been at Slack four years. I actually got to Stock Exchange. It was super fun. I can get to that a little bit later. I'm also a mom. I have one and a half children, one being with a nanny right now and the other half being here. Um, so let's move forward. I'm talking about, I'm going to talk fast. We don't have a ton of time. I've given this talk before. Everyone listens to podcasts in one and a half or two X speed. So I think you'll be able to follow along. If you can't hear me at any point, just be like, slow down. And I will slow down. I'm also with a cord. Cool. We're talking about frameworks for predicting the next big trend in tech or in media. So I think this is my alternative topic header. When I was in venture capital, the biggest thing we did was we would trend. So you'd think about like a roadmap where you'd invest into the future of it. So one of them that I did when I was in venture capital was actually a video roadmap. And we thought a ton about video it was really fun. Taught me how to sort of like get into a trend, get deep in it. And that's sort of the genesis of how Anne and I came up with this content. So I wanted to open pretty interactively. I think it's for us to have a little bit of a conversation. <coughs> I want to talk about three trends that are totally tangential and just interesting things in the world. What could have helped you predict this trend? Has anyone seen the oat milk trend? Raise your hand if you've heard about oat milk lately. Why is oat milk popular? Just throw out ideas. Yeah? Yes, so I read a bunch about this in preparation for this class. Apparently it froths better and it tastes better than almond milk. It's the closest thing to real milk that you can get. Yeah? And the just coffee trends, lots and lots of trendy coffee places, they're going to jump on a trend like this. Exactly, coffee trends. So if I was going to sort of break down why I think oat milk has gotten so popular, part of it is also just there's a culture right now around coffee, especially in our country and in a lot of Western countries where we're trying to drink the next cool thing and trying to look cool. We have extra money to spend. We've been doing really well. What's interesting in coffee? Milk made of oatmeal. Who knows what this is? Oh, go ahead. Do you have another thought on that? I was just going to say there's a lot of controversy about production of almond milk. That is the other big one. So basically a single almond takes a gallon of water. So oat milk is a little bit more sustainable, um, notably in the growing of the oats, not in the production of the actual milk. That was another interesting thing to learn about. Who knows what this picture is of? Raise your hand if you do. So this is Fortnite. Who's heard of Fortnite? Everybody, right? <coughs> Why Fortnite? Why the heck is this thing so popular, sweeping tweens, teens? I mean, plenty. do people in college play it? I assume they do. Adults play it. They're, it's been cited in divorces, apparently. <laughs> yeah? Yes. So free. That's one of the big ah, for, for free. Really? Big, yeah? I heard that the developers took the gaming model. From oh, really? So they were first, it was something that was very popular. That's they also like made it not a mature game. So on that point, so you said you made it, you made it a not too sophisticated, but like a, a kid-oriented game. There's a lot, when I looked up sort of why this thing is so popular, around the fact that it's fun. So like note in the corner, there's a banana raising his arms. There are a couple other things. Here. You can customize Fortnite for yourself. So if I'm a character in Fortnite, the further I go with it, the more I can sort of like identify with my character because I can customize it a ton. Another piece here. That's really interesting is there's a lot of like spectacle and hilarity. Does anyone know anything about this? People who have played? Have you seen like epic fails in Fortnite? They're, one of the big things when you're losing is that you can like go out in style because it's a really tense game and you fail pretty fast. But like it's a shrinking. You're with 100 people and you're trying to survive and make it on the island. So most of those people are failing as the game goes on. And people like to do epic fails go down. I can't really floss, but has anyone seen this dance? Like characters in Fortnite floss. That's totally also playing off of pop culture. So one of the other pieces here, Fortnite has co-opted pop culture into the game super effectively. COD, very, very popular, Call of Duty, where you, you know, kill everybody. It's not co-opting pop culture the same way that a Fortnite is. 
because Fortnite is allowing you to bring in pop culture references, memes, and dances. So there's something about the fact that it's bringing in what you're experiencing as a kid and letting you have fun with memes. And perhaps as an adult, I don't know. All right, anyone know what this logo is that's also turning into a question mark? TikTok. TikTok. Who watches TikTok? It's the best. Oh my gosh, I just downloaded it to do a little bit of research and and suddenly you're like 30 minutes have gone away. What the heck? Why is TikTok popular? Where did that come from? Yeah. The company ByteDance has a lot of experience at least in China and using machine learning to identify sort of videos that you might, you might really enjoy. Yeah. So most interesting trend that I think as I like I've done this lecture a couple of years in a row, and I think AI is actually one of the machine learning in reality is one of the most interesting for us to be following right like the next major platform to be following as TikTok did a huge shift from your Twitter or your Facebook or your Instagram Twitter Facebook and Instagram are based off of like you guys are my friends so I just see what you show me and then maybe they'll start inserting other stuff that other people are showing me but I have to curate my own friend list in order to get my content TikTok doesn't do that. It's 100% algorithm based. So I show up in the app, it doesn't even know who I am, and it starts showing me stuff based off of me saying, I want to see comedy and I want to see DIY. And, I, and I'm having an amazing time right away, and then I can add friends. Yeah. So, tech friend thing, phone's now good enough to make these kinds of videos. The phone sucks. So, mobile is another huge trend that I'll be talking about a lot in sort of the place that I got into tech. Um, but, yeah. Just the ubiquity of phones. One of the other the things about video edit, the video stuff specifically, the video editing tools in TikTok were amazing. Yes, and you can make them really good. In my appendix, I have my talk from two years ago where I actually was saying, like, what? Oh, maybe I'll just pop over there. Let's just pop down there. All right, ignore all my slides. So, yeah, there's a lot of them. Let's years ago was influencers and the fact that they've decentralized fame. Um, she went to Stanford, was here the same couple years I was. But a really interesting thing in the world of media and video is that you have these Goliaths and they're building their own custom content or taking the influencers of the, on their platform and paying them to build. And so for a while you had these video apps popping up. Vine, everyone remember Vine? Got bought by Twitter, died. Uh -huh. um, okay. Now TikTok is Vine too. So one of the interesting preceding trends for TikTok is that Vine is really popular. And basically, which TikTok, it owns TikTok, it's also really popular. Years ago when I was giving this talk, I was like, when, what's the next thing in video? Like, what is going to happen here? And now, fortunately, we're having this thing. Turns out the next trend was TikTok. And turns out it's also very, very based on algorithms. And that was the big, the big change is that it's totally not based on your friend set. It's based on, sorry, bleh. it's based on um, what it expects you to like because they have an algorithm that's really good at knowing what makes strong content. What's also really fun about that is as an influencer, as someone who's aspiring to become an influencer, so someone producing the content, I have a shot at the big This app, if it knows that I have produced interesting content, will suddenly disseminate it in a huge way. That followership really get. Thoughts on that? Those are our three warm up trends. When you try to spot trends, it's science. Like you read the article from HBR. They give you different framework that's about sort of like really getting to know one major trend in order, to, in order to get to know the next major trend. But there are a lot of factors in culture that determine what's going to happen. And there's no rubric, in my opinion, to bring it all out. A bunch of the trend predicting you're reading for this class ago, there's a set of that never really That's part of the trend. Um, I'll give you a bunch of different things. The last piece is, I think curiosity is the number one thing to have in order to predict trends well. Oh, is my mic messed up? Sorry. So if you want to really figure out how to predict trends, just enjoy yourself and poke around in what's fun. So let's start with the story about the genesis of Slack. I'll try. Slack, so Stuart Butterfield is our CEO. It was Stuart and 
their co-founder's second attempt to build a video game. Their first attempt to build a video game turned into the company called Flickr. Flickr was a photo sharing app. It originated as a video game and then turned out the photo sharing element of the video game was really popular and they sold that to Yahoo for a whole bunch of money. Round two started a game called Glitch. It was popular but with a very niche set of people. They went back to investors and said, hey, we really wanted to make it a go with this video game, but it's getting enough usage for us to do well. But we built something. This is my CEO, Stuart, dressed up in weird clothes. Um, I don't think he'd want me to put these up. He's like fancy now. Um, he, they said, we built this thing ba ba based off of IRC. Anyone use IRC or know what IRC is? OK, well, engineer. Basically, IRC, a messaging product on steroids to run their video game business, and said, we could take this and turn it into a company. And their investors said, yeah, do it. So, I'm not going to get into the depth of that. That turned into a product called Slack. How many people have used Slack? How much should I describe Slack? All right, so a fair amount of people here have used Slack. It's a messaging app for people at work, also a platform. So if you want Slack to integrate with the Google Docs that you're sharing, or your calendaring app, or your task management, or whatever the heck you're using to do all of your work, we can integrate that with Slack in the channels where you're doing your work. We've grown really well. I actually, so I joined in 2015. Um, we've gotten to 10 million daily active users, which is really solid for um, sort of like speed of growth in a productivity app. We went public uh, actually this year, a couple months ago. It was really fun. I got to go to New York Stock Exchange. Really interesting. We did a direct listing. If you're interested in that stuff, look up what that is. But within like a trend predicting framework, where do we place Slack? So I'm going to tell you where I sort of came up with my trend predicting framework and how Slack fits in. These are a bunch of logos of Slack alternatives that popped up at the exact same time that Slack launched. That one's called Hall. That one's called CoCap. That one's Taco. Don't even remember that name. And that one is um, a competitor that we eventually acquired that's owned by Atlassian called HipChat, which was our biggest competitor before we acquired them. Most interesting of all of these, has everyone heard of Yammer? Yammer is like a social network for people at business that got bought by Microsoft. CoTap, the messaging app for people at work, was started by the founder of Yammer. If someone had a shot at winning the like, messaging product within a B2B, within the business circumstance, it should have been CoTap. Like, that's literally what they had already built. They built Facebook for work and did well with it. They should build messaging for work. But somehow, Slack won. This is how you could have potentially predicted that there was going to be something really big in this messaging space. So this is what I used to do in venture capital. Actually, I did this when I was at Box um, with, with Emergence Capital. So this is another VC that I, I'd worked with. At the time, so back in 2011, 2012, mobile was everything. Mobile back then was like, whoa, suddenly we can compute on our phones and there's all this stuff to do. VCs who were going out to just bet on companies that were mobile only. Now mobile is table stakes. It's eight years. And if you are building a company without some mobile component, what are you doing? Like mobile is obvious. So in my job at Box, I actually spent a bunch of time talking to every single mobile app because I was trying to get them all to integrate and partner with Box. And that, so this is what this was called. This was called OneCloud. There's our CEO, Aaron Levy, talking about OneCloud to the press. We put a billboard up of all the apps that we got to integrate with Box. We thought it was really hot and sexy. No one's heard of OneCloud now. That thing is done. We just had a billboard on the 101. It was cool. But out of following B2B mobile, which is what we call that. B2B means business to business. It was, I was looking at little like, companies that were springing up on mobile to serve people in the workplace. Most of these companies don't exist anymore or like, aren't exciting anymore. They were startups. They were hot. They came and went. But out of them, Slack was the old logo, RIP old logo. Um, <laughs> Slack survived and did really well. The rest of these are pretty much gone. They got acquired. Does anyone remember Mailbox? It was like a really hot trend. I love how like, the undergrads don't remember Mailbox anymore. Because when I was an undergrad, it was started by Stanford undergrads, and it was like so hot. Um, Mailbox was an email app that had this like huge, huge, exciting following. And then Dropbox acquired it. Mailbox is gone. So what's interesting is like these were really hot for a hot second, but one of them survived. So trends to get trends. The trend 
that begot Slack and sort of the like mobile ecosystem wave was mobile. Mobile was like the big thing. So when you get to know mobile really, really well, you can then look at like who's winning and what's making them win. I can tell you about a couple other things that I think made Slack win, but they're kind of irrelevant. Trends become standard really, really quickly. Like mobile is table stakes now. This is not like a hot, sexy trend. When I was first getting into the workforce, it was like, oh my gosh, are you doing something on mobile? It was called so low mobile. Social, local, mobile. And that was like really, really exciting. Because social was also kind of exciting too. Um, and the way that you're looking at this makes a really big difference, but we're not going to get into that now. Um, so this is what my article is. I don't know if you guys read it. But the framework that I've built is that basically there's a flywheel for how platforms emerge. Um, just get into it on iOS and talk about that. I hope we're following. I'm trying to move fast. Essentially, the framework goes, there's a new platform that comes out. Developers in the ecosystem respond because they want to reach users on the platform that's emerging. This makes the platform inherently more valuable because things are getting built into it. And then the next platform comes out of that as this momentum builds because you get users on all these new things. So let's just talk about this on mobile specifically. So one of the big things back in the day with mobile was that iPhone had better apps than Android. And that was just standard. And I, that made iPhone have like, higher paying users because it was a more lucrative platform to be on. So let's talk about how this flywheel works. So the iPhone had a really, really good launch and showed strong customer pickup. And developers who could build apps for the iPhone were very, very interested. So they said, hey, we want to be on the platform. After some debate, they opened the platform up so they could build apps on the ecosystem. One of the big things that was interesting is that Apple was really, really picky about who be on the platform. So if you wanted to build an iOS app, it had to be decent for it to get through. Three, as I used my iPhone, suddenly it became 10 times more useful because it wasn't just maps, texting, and calling. It was suddenly like my workout app and a bunch of other things that are really, really useful to me. The way we use our phones now is not purely for phone features. So this is making the iPhone much more useful. This is making the iPhone a superior product to Android because the apps on it are better. Therefore, more iPhones are bought because iPhones are better than, than Android because they have better apps. And more developers build for iPhone first. Back in the day when I was doing all this mobile ecosystem stuff, one of the really interesting things was every developer I talked to who was building especially these like for work apps, they were building iPhone first or iPhone only for a long time. They had limited engineering resources, so they could only build on one platform to start. And then once they built on that one platform, they knew that the iPhone users tended to pay more for apps, um, and they could deliver a better experience on it. So they were building for iPhone first. This is kind of a non-starter at this point. Android's gotten just as good, if not better. Um, but it was an interesting little thing to watch. And the idea here is, out of this trend spinning up and this ecosystem spinning up, suddenly you had some new interesting coming out. So Slack is a good example of that, where it was like mobile was sort of a given from day one. Um, another interesting one actually is Fortnite, where they've allowed their product to be on any platform that you want it to be. So you can play Fortnite on your phone, even though it's like a much worse, like you're probably not going to win the game on your phone because it's harder to win from that perspective because you can also play it on a console. It's like really, really powerful. But just ubiquity of software is a big deal on this. The flywheel is really complicated. Windows is a great example of it, but it's like a very, very complicated thing. I'm not going to get into this because we need to keep moving. One of the things I want to talk about in terms of platforms begetting platforms is messaging. So when we're on our phones, turns out one of the tip top things we're doing on our phones is messaging. Who spends at least like of the apps you've used today? Have you texted or used WhatsApp or something like that? Raise your hand. Uh, everyone has. It's like the thing we do on our phones. So here are interesting stats. Slack actually plays into this a lot. So our users usually have the product open for at least two hours a day where they're actively working in it. Um, but if you look at other like global messaging apps, these are just the top apps that people use, period. So what trends are growing out of the messaging trend? Because there are trends coming out of it. They're a little played out now. Um, I'm just going to move to the next piece. I'm just going to talk really quickly for Slack, and then I want to get into the consumer ones. Because, again, we have 15 minutes left, and there's some interesting stuff to get to at the end. 
So let's talk about bots. When Slack and the, our platform was first going up, bots were like the hot thing. Everyone thought work with bots and the bots. Um, but what's really interesting is if you look at like how people think about trends, bots seem like they be one of the more overhyped trends had in the last couple years. And in media, this is actually particularly interesting. We had a number of media bots pop up with media partners. This one never got um, went live because Bloomberg has their own terminal and like it would be competitive. It would cannibalize them. But we have an HBR bot, for instance, for Slack that sends you regular HBR um, articles. It's actually a really cool app, but these things never became sort of the de facto way that you get your news. It turns out we can get our news a bunch of other ways, and we don't need bots to do that. Um, there are other bots that are pretty popular. For instance, like you can use Concur to do your expenses in Slack. That's kind of a bot. But again, this is just something that's functional, helping you get your job done. It's not like, this is the future. My mind is blown. This is everything to me. Um, I'm going to move on to here. What's really interesting, and this is actually something that is being used weekly, regularly at major media outlets, is that bots that exist and are built by and for media companies by themselves are really popular. So this is an example of the LA Times bot, but the New York Times has a ton um, as do m many major media outlets. They actually deliver, like work on producing content onto their website through a bot in Slack. This is because journalists love being on Slack. It's immediate, it's fast, it's, you can see everything in one place, unlike email where it's siloed. Um, I'll just give you the example of like why, because it's helpful to understand the mechanics of Slack. Slack is built on a channel, in channels instead of email threads. So what's nice in a channel is that if we two are talking in a channel, all of you can see it. If we two are talking on email, Y'all can't see it. So it helps everyone keep context and join a conversation if they need to. That's what makes it really, really, really useful for journalists. So here's an example of the LA Times news bot for their front page, but there are a ton of different kinds of these. Um, basically, every time a reporter finishes an article, it gets popped into a channel. And the person who's managing what's on the front page of their website can then basically push this onto their front page or not. So, they basically can check a box here, building, using a custom app that they've built, which we used to call a bot, but now it's called an app, and say this is the, a lead. And then when they update things, um, you get like the slug and all the different pieces, and what happens to it, so like he updated the story status to be a lead, it tells you on the thread in Slack that it's going to be a lead, and then eventually you can click publish to the front page of the website. It's a much easier way of getting um, the news onto their website every day. One of the interesting things about this is the software that they were using previously to get their website running was just not very well built because there's not a ton of money in building tools to help the media publish their news on websites. Our interface in Slack is something they're extremely familiar with and all these little tools like buttons and, and the links and stuff, those are really easy for them to build in because we have an API that lets you do that. So this is actually an easier way for them to deliver the news to their site daily. Um, the New York Times uses it. They have a really good article, if you want to look it up, if you're curious about it, about how they ran election coverage uh, using Slack. They basically had a Slack channel where they were just talking about the election coverage, and then they'd click pub. They had every single message they were sending have a button on it, and if they wanted to live blog it, they would publish. They could click publish from the messages they were sending in the Slack channel, and it would publish to their website as part of their live blog, which is a really cool, is a really cool story as well. Did you have a question? Just, I, I couldn't tell if you raised your hand. No, you don't. We'll keep going. Is that sort of clear? Any other questions on this? One of the conclusions on this is that while we thought that bots would be this huge future, perhaps they are not, but being able to build your own custom functionality in the product of Slack is actually really, really powerful, and it's what we see our customers doing. So especially in the field of media, being able to build custom applications within Slack for your need to help you get the news out more effectively and quickly is working great for our customers. Um, I skipped two of these points because they're not that interesting. Let's get into consumer messaging. So WeChat, Insta Instagram, and Snapchat. How could you have predicted WeChat's dominance? Is someone here from China? Usually there's someone from China. 
a little bit about how that. Okay. All my friends back home as an Uber, as um, gaming, mm -hmm. shopping, pay but uh, PayPal. So like all the apps that are popular on the phone, the page is on the chat. Which is crazy. So just to reiterate that. In China, WeChat is the one app to rule them all. Like, you use all your other apps through the messaging app WeChat. That was potentially a trend that we thought could pick up in the States or in other parts of the world, but it hasn't. Why did this go this way in China? It's a really large population, obviously, so it's a huge trend. This is a huge shift in the way messaging that turned into the dominant paradigm to use all your other applications and services. One of the major forces here was the government. So there was like a government that is a little more controlling about how things work in China. And WeChat always had a really popular, uh, it was always really popular with the government. And they were able to have lockdown there. So because it was a product that was allowed to be used, app developers who wanted to reach their users said, we'll go to WeChat. That's where we're like allowed to reach people. So that's an interesting sort of force in the market that caused this trend to be the way it is. Another really interesting uh, shift to the way messaging happened. Um, this is a little old at this point, but Snapchat really changed the messaging paradigm. Uh, essentially what Snapchat did, and when you talk to Evan Spiegel, this is how he thought about it, is it went, took messaging from being something where I'm texting you and it's words or emoji in a text bar. And it made video and photos equal to text in the chat paradigm. And that was a super effective way to sort of transform the way we think about messaging. And it made Snapchat super popular. Because Snapchat, I don't use it that often, but it's actually a way I talk with my sister. Because she's younger, and that's how she messages with her friends. So it's like a messaging app that keeps me in the app because it's a way she messages. And half the time, her messages are photos, and half the time, we end up texting. Anyone have this experience with Snapchat? Who still uses Snapchat? I'm actually just curious. All right, so a couple of people. It's kind of dying off now. Another really interesting piece in the chat story is that Evan was really oriented towards doing traditional media in Snapchat. So if you looked at Instagram or looked at the way Facebook played, they were willing to just let any advertiser come on the platform. Evan was very focused on traditional media outlets, and like this was slightly confidential when he told me, but he never really liked influencers that much, whereas other platforms were more influencer positive. And that's why back in the day when you saw their Discover page, it was traditional media outlets that they were promoting before influencers who were getting really big, which is a very different way to approach. And I don't know if I would say it was successful. That would be something interesting for people to dive into if you're just curious about like digging into why these products have worked well or not. Um, and then Instagram. Instagram didn't used to be a messaging app. It was just a photo sharing app. How many of you use Instagram to actually end up talking to people on a semi-regular basis? I Instagram has become, in many ways, a messaging product. And that's because Facebook wants to keep your eyeballs in their products. And to keep your eyeballs in their products, they know messaging is the thing we're doing on phones. So they turned it into a messaging app. And they also did a really good job of that really fast when they needed to, and it just kind of killed Snapchat a little bit. Does everyone kind of feel that way? Did a lot of people use Snapchat and then suddenly Instagram usurped it? That was my experience. Cool. So I think the most interesting thing I'm trying to show you out of those different examples of consumer and Slack uh, messaging products is there isn't like one result from a trend happening. So messaging clearly is something that people are spending their time doing, but WeChat is an example of a really extreme trend and the government forces and, and other forces, because they also probably just killed it in the UI and nothing in um, the West probably opened up the UI properly for a WeChat kind of result to happen. Um, so like that's a really extreme result. Instagram's another really good example of like, okay, messaging's where we need to go. We're gonna go become that, that messaging thing. And they, they jumped on the trend fast enough to keep dominance and to keep control. Um, external forces do play a really big role in the, the way a trend gets shaped. Um, I think about that from a, how, how is the media, like the traditional 
capital M media shaping what's happening in tech versus how is what's happening in tech shaping what's happening in media. Um, that's a nebulous statement. But if you, the last thing is if you get to know a trend really well, you're going to be able to predict or have like some senses of what's coming out of it. And that's pretty much the number one takeaway from my talk, I'd say. Um, adjacent trends to messaging, anonymous AI and voice, I think are really interesting. Anonymous is really interesting. Did anyone use anonymous apps here? Sorry, I'm having you raise your hands a lot. Okay, so a fair amount of people have used anonymous apps. Do you use them anymore? Anonymous apps are gone. Anonymous was like really cool for a little while. Um, Yik Yak is that one, um, started by some kids at Furman. This one was called After School. It was for like high schoolers and middle schoolers. <laughs> it was disastrous. <laughs> so <laughs> they're whisper in secret. These were a really big deal for a while. Most interesting thing about anonymous as a theme or a trend, the problem with anonymous is that it's anonymous, so you have no, when you come back to it, people don't know who you are, and you have no like identity tied to it. So that's actually slightly problematic because there's no, um, there's no like buy-in or, or like lasting effect that, to keep you in the product. And that's probably one of the reasons. Um, it was definitely an overflow of the mobile and messaging set of trends, but it totally didn't. Yeah. And on the anonymous point, though, it's interesting. Like Reddit could technically be considered anonymous, and it's doing well because there is an associated identity. I think it's different. It's pseudonymous, right? Pseudonyms. Yeah. These apps are technically pseudonymous, right? There are sort of pseudonyms, but they must be. Yeah, they. I think, they added, like, yeah, I think they tried to add them in the end. They have to report to the FBI if you like post a bot trend. Yeah. Right. Like 4chan and 8chan. Very much anonymous, and that's where you plan your mouse Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Reddit is an interesting one that I don't, I haven't like studied Reddit that much. And actually, in the world of media, Reddit would be a very interesting area to study and figure out like, has something major sprung, major things have sprung out of Reddit for sure. I'll let you guys go there on your own. I don't know enough to talk about it. AI. My number one thing, especially having been briefly in venture capital, is that AI is usually just machine learning. <laughs> Parroting as like, I am an artificial person that actually has a soul and, a, and is humanity. Um, it's been a human for a really long time. This is the first artificial robot, I forget his name. Um, there's from the Jetsons, the Rosie the robot who helped them out. So AI and like robots that help you do things or, um, have personalities and make their own choices. That's been in our imaginations for a long time, which is an interesting thing in and of itself that we've been thinking about this for a while. Um, machine learning is the real term for it, I'd say. I think TikTok is one of the most interesting examples of where algorithms using machine learning are changing the way that we consume our media on your Instagram, on your Twitter, um, the way that you're getting your news feeds now, that is totally algorithmic based at this point, um, or they're trying to like get you to stay on the feed, so they're trying to feed you content that's going to make be more interesting. Um, some of the really scary applications of AI are around sort of fake news and content creation and generation to the deep fakes point. I, the biggest concern I have in the category of AI is that it's going to be so hard for a non-major player to break in. Google and Microsoft and probably Facebook, I just know Google and Microsoft do, have armies of professors at tip-top universities producing machine learning research and feeding it to them. If you're a smaller player and you're trying to break in here, that's hard to beat. The minds of a thousand tip-top people in the field versus your small startup trying to do machine learning and AI, it's a really hard moat to overcome. So that's one of my biggest questions for the future of AI and machine learning and application. I think one of the other questions is, in, in the world of media, how much do we care about human curation versus algorithmic curation becoming better than human curation? What do we think on that front? I'm just posing open questions because our time is out. Um, other paradigm, voice. I'll just let you read these questions. Our time has run out. Takeaways, get to know a trend really, really well in order to get to know the new one. One of the things we're talking about a lot in tech right now is there's no like really big hot emerging platform at the moment. There was social, there was mobile, there were these messaging apps that kind of had a hot moment in the sun. What's next? I was talking to a friend who ran pretty much all of Microsoft under Bomber. Um, and I was like, what's next? And he was like, everyone's so 
patient about figuring out what's next because there's so much money in the private markets. Everyone wants to bet on that thing that's next right now. He's like, wait five years and it'll be really obvious. In 2004, it was not obvious that Facebook was the next big thing. But in 2007, it started getting really obvious. So we're at an interesting moment in technology itself, like by itself, in terms of the shift. There isn't some obvious, really hot thing. You have to be curious to be successful in this. And you just have to like really try and dig deep into what's next. Um, sometimes it helps to look back at trends in order to look forward. So if you look at Windows, it'd be interesting to see how mobile ended up emerging and doing really well. Um, consider external forces, where is like money and power consolidated or personality playing a role in making a trend successful? That's totally real. Um, human behavior is a top indicator. So people are spending most of their time on here, on messaging apps, something interesting is going to be happening with messaging or the big players need to bet on that product in order to stay relevant. Um, and you know everything. People used to like, was going to be a really cool people to it was actually like a huge prediction, really exciting. We all thought we were going to be like, they were right. It's just it took another 50 years now to all those crazy wheel things. Yes, a different version of the segue. Yeah, it's true. It's just that you need less of a long stick and less of a mall cop vibe. Um, I have a couple of big outstanding questions. We are out of time, no, no, so. Fine. We have, we, we have, uh, we've got oh, so cool. Laps, so cool. I'll cool. slow down then. So here are my big outstanding questions as I've thought about the talk, et cetera. Facebook. They are in the eye. This is a slide from last year's talk. It is still 100% relevant and true. What? Like, are we ever going to abandon Facebook properties because we as consumers feel exploited? We feel like actually the government's just really trying to scapegoat Facebook. What's going to happen in social media? Like, and what's the next era of social networking? Because it feels like there's something that's going to shift. Like, I don't use Facebook the way I used to. I try hard to get myself off Instagram because it's freaking addictive. Like, I think people are going to start trying to take their minds back because a lot of these products are built to keep us like dopamine reacting and really distracted. What's going to happen here? Something's going to happen. This one's interesting. In entertainment, how can anyone beat the incumbents at this point? Netflix, now Apple's trying to get in the game. HBO, they're building content that they know is just going to sit there and make us binge. And the biggest trend that you see coming out of this is the billions, probably, of dollars being poured into producing original content. We love their original content, and they have all our data for why we love their original content. What happens here? Like, one of the things that's happening that like, is a result is all this original content getting built. It's nuts. And the fact that Apple's trying to get in on that game, wow, there's a lot of money in it. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, probably because I have a child and I'm really curious about what's going to happen to education. One of the themes that I didn't get to go into here is that power, like with technology, power gets decentralized. So what you saw in media for a while, and I think media is kind of like almost leveled out a little more than it had five years ago when everyone was kind of like, newspapers are dying, magazines are dying, what's going to happen? That's gotten a little more stable, perhaps. But power, so who has the microphone, got decentralized. So it went from you know CNN and Fox and a couple other people have the microphone, and you listen to the news from them, to anyone on Twitter who can get some pick up and have the microphone, and they're that decentralized the power of who had the microphone. Same thing is happening in education in an interesting way. So suddenly, all the information we can ever imagine is pretty much accessible to us. This video is going to be on the internet, and anyone who really wants to watch it can go watch it. What does that mean for higher education? I doubt it would threaten like elite institutions like a Stanford or the Ivies. But for sort of middling colleges with this huge student debt crisis, what does it mean for getting a college degree? So there are a lot of people who are thinking, is, is a college degree or the process of education, higher education, going to be unbundled? Has anyone followed the Lambda School thing? So if you think a hot thing in tech right now, Lambda School is actually one of those hot things. It essentially is a coding boot camp type of school that um, if you get a job coming out of it, you give them a percentage of your paycheck. If you don't get a job out of it, you just don't pay them. And it's been really, really popular. It helps people land great jobs in tech after they use it. It's a good education. The founder is 
really damn good at Twitter, so he's gotten a lot of people excited about him. Um, but one of the conversations I've been watching in sort of my tech Twitter world is, is homeschooling the future. And if you think about it, when I think about my daughter and like the, what I see in schools, there's actually all the information that she needs to learn is accessible. It's the social element that would be missing. What is that going to look like? And apparently, actually, in the Palo Alto, Menlo Park, greater area, homeschool and co-ops are getting a lot more popular because they teach kids how to self-direct instead of just being told, sit in the class, learn the thing, take the test, be done. It's like, OK, you need to go read these four books in, the, in this week and give me a report by the end of the week. They can figure out how to manage their time. They can figure out how to read it. So the transformation of education, it feels like we're on the brink of something shifting here. That said, this one's a really messy and tricky one because education is a very sensitive subject, especially to parents, I think. Um, and then in the news, this one's just kind of sad. We're in just a really divided and angry time as a nation, and we're just, we're split in a way that we've never been, like, uh, uh, in my generation, I haven't seen a split like this. I don't know if other people have, if you've sensed this split before in American politics? Not like this. No, so we're in a really particularly divided wi place, how do we come back together? You see a lot of Democratic candidates talking about we need to unite the nation, but what is that really going to look like? Uh, we don't know. And the way that the media is playing into this is really interesting because if you're conservative and you live in a conservative media and Twitter and, and Instagram bubble, you're reading reinforcing views. You're also probably, and if you're liberal, you're reading totally reinforcing views making you so angry at the conservatives. So we're just getting angrier and angrier. And the other really bizarre piece behind this is the amount of Russian agencies behind a bunch of that news is really, really high and really disturbing. So what do we do at this point? How do we control fake news? How do we stop foreign bodies from manipulating the way that we are getting angry at each other as a nation while also dealing with the reality of the things that we should be angry about? I don't know. And can technology and AI actually help on this front somehow? That's one of my big questions for this room, because you are all thinking about this. So that's it. In order to try and predict, you don't need to go get some fancy degree. You just need to go learn about things and read things on the internet. All the information tends to be there. Um, all categories are open for predictions. I just went through a bunch of really random categories that I find interesting. Um, once you predict, you can use that to your advantage. So. Uh, you can go get a job in a category that you're interested in. One of the reasons why I did what I did at Box is because I saw mobile was an exciting trend and thought I should work on mobile. So I doubled down on putting my career into mobile and that went well. Um, you can use this course as a way, I mean you just did the sign-up sheets for like what, your, what discussion sections you're going to lead, as a way to dig really deep on different categories. So if that's AI, if that's voice, if that's VR and AR, you can use this as a way to really get deep on one of those trends and then try and figure out what's the next thing that's going to be really exciting in those trends. It also will let you discredit trends because every trend that we're sitting and talking about isn't going to be the next big hot thing. So that's it. Let's talk about stuff. And feel free to email me. <laughs> naturally curious when something yeah. one if you're just following your natural inclinations it's pretty much just following what you're interested in I mean if, if my trend that I buy was sci-fi based like I don't know being sci-fi I'd totally be happy with going down that road even though it probably isn't relevant to most people because it's making me happy and is an interesting thing and it's never to have a world in my opinion biggest trying to go more broad and figure out the next big thing money in is figure out how to get fast no's. So um, in venture, one of the best ways to do that was basically to figure out how to use like a BS sniffer. That having someone who is technically competent and who had been around for a long time to say, all this um, 
big data was like all the hotness for a long time. And you'd meet with founders of companies and they'd be like, it's just a big data platform. And they'd be like, what does that actually mean? So if you're able to sniff out when someone is clearly talking about something as if it's this really big, great thing, but it means nothing, getting to a fast no on that, that's, that's a top piece. So one of our questions as we were thinking about your talk was teenagers are using more and more images and short videos and one and two word text. Hmm. What is, how does that affect the communications options and trends? I don't know. I do think we are in an interesting era of quick hit with our brains. So my question would be how is that impacting the way we think and the way we produce um, and like the, the way we create like is are we actually is like the way that our social media and text interactions behave actually making us dumber is a, is a question that I have I wonder I wonder about that for myself when I find myself suddenly bouncing between a couple different social media apps and not actually getting anything done or not being able to really focus on building a body of work for my job I wonder like oh I think I've been like quick hit snacking on information too much all day to be able to really focus deeply. So I think there's that. I don't know about short content. I wonder if sometimes that's just about getting our message relayed and being done with it. I don't know. What do you think? Well, as someone who's older and I have kids and I watch them grow up in a completely different technological world than the one I grew up in, yeah. I wonder if that repeats. You know, your kids, yeah. will they have a different pace and style of communication that you really don't get. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so that's one of the... I do think generations build culture to feel like they're in a in cohort. There's a big psychology component here. And that perhaps is what you're seeing. Yeah. They've created, there's a subculture within Gen Z. It's not a bad thing. most part and they have this army of researchers and, and professionals that they're using to sort of uh, secure their future in that field. How do you think that impacts companies like Slack that are sort of more on the medium size but might not be in that inner circle owning MLA? Yeah, so I, the reason why I actually know that is because I was working on um, a potential sort of AI ML play for Slack and narrative that we could have put out about the future of using search learning and intelligence, that was a branch that we used to have in our company, to improve the way that you use Slack. And as I did research, as I like looked into it more, I realized that we couldn't beat Google's ability to predict who you're going to invite to in a calendar event. Like One of the ways I've seen this in my day life, I don't know if you guys use Google Calendar, I bet a lot of you do, Stanford uses Gmail, right? Google Calendar and Gmail are really, really smart at predicting what you're going to write in your emails and who you're going to invite on your calendar slots and things like that. They have really great ML behind that. For Slack, um, we wanted to figure out how to surface you the most relevant unread messages because if you use Slack a lot, it becomes there, there are a lot of unread messages. It's kind of like a lot to manage. So we were trying to figure out, okay, let's make a home page and we'll surface the most important information to you first so that you can sort of just get on with your day if that's all you want to do. That alone is a really hard machine learning problem. We hired really, really smart machine learning people for it. Um, that product came into existence and doesn't really exist anymore because it was too hard to maintain and there are too many other big important product features that we need to focus on for our core users and for growing the business as a whole. So um, I don't want to be negative about my company at all. I think we're doing really well, but it makes it hard. Like playing against Google in that field is pretty hard. And that's not a product we're doubling down on anymore because the other ones are more important. We can't spend those like great engineering resources on this thing that will be good, but not the And I assume that in five years from now, um, Slack will probably still be around. That's when we'll get to that. And hopefully some of this, some of the, that learning will be democratized. That's an interesting question for the computer scientists in the world. What gets open sourced in terms of machine learning um, and what stays sort of behind closed walls? Um, it's a really, really interesting topic in the field of computer science and it will that, like deeply impact the way our daily lives go and the way different products get access to smart machine learning. Yeah. 
what about privacy with um, what they're you know, doing in Europe? Is it even possible to control state, or is that even an area where uh, startups can, you know, start products so that individuals can have more control of what information is out there? So the question was, privacy is really important. Um, and in Europe, they're doing a lot to really help and like consumer and individual privacy be upheld, basically. Um, what's interesting is I found out that Germany's been the lead on that. And apparently, that's also because of what happened in World War II, because their privacy got so violated uh, by the government. A lot of that, the way that Germany is so focused on privacy is actually a, a positive overflow of World War II and their learnings from it because they, they know that individual privacy is really important um, from the state and from big corporations. The question was, is it possible for companies to help us develop enough, um, privacy from these products like Facebook and uh, Google where I don't even have Instagram on, my, Instagram on my phone anymore, but I know, so I had Invisalign when I was um, a couple years ago. I would talk about it with my coworkers. Some of them had Instagram open. They were just looking at Instagram while we were talking about it. They all started getting Invisalign because they heard us and it's listening like your your products are listening from your phone that's pretty much a fact um i don't know the answer to that i know that if you talk to anyone in the privacy sector they would say it's possible but it's hard so like if you're talking to someone at there are privacy startups or startups focus on this they would say yes it's possible we're doing it for you um but I don't, I'm not a privacy expert there is a the world of security and privacy i've worked with some people in this field is a world like they are it's, it's a different breed of folks and they are thinking on different levels the, the world of the dark web and security is a big one that i didn't know anything about i know this much about it so i can't really answer your question effectively um but i think you're going to get both yes and no as an answer from experts is my guess yes uh, yes for, for for media companies and, and talking about newspapers in general is it is it in their best interest in many ways to sort of ignore trends because i think one of the biggest problems with trends is that like they're often dependent on platforms mm -hmm. and if you become too dependent on that platform uh, and the platform decides to change their minds about something then it can destroy your business so great example is like buzzfeed depending on facebook's algorithm too much uh, and then they got burned uh, once facebook changed their newsfeed rankings um, newsfeed algorithm um, and so newspapers now are like uh, shifting or, or, or investing heavily in subscriptions. Yeah, it seems like it's working. Isn't that better for them to sort of ignore some of the trends that are dependent on platforms and just build their own business? What do you think? Yeah? I think so. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I come from a newspaper background. Cool. You could describe subscriptions as a trend that is working. That's true. Yeah. But, it's a, but yeah, so yeah. committing yourself to Facebook was a terrible trend. Yeah. Subscriptions have been around. Pivots to video. Decades. But like three years ago, everyone thought that BuzzFeed was actually winning and like beating everyone out in traditional media. So I think it's a yes and. I think like your answer, I think the answer is like, yes, you're right. But if you're really smart, you're also figuring out how do I use those things to drive my subscription business? Like how am I using Twitter? How am I using Facebook? How am I using dissemination? to drive my business. Like TikTok has done this pretty well actually because they have the little brand at the end of their video and I think Snapchat got angry enough at face at Instagram for suppressing their videos. Um, I don't know if you guys have read the Project Voldemort article. Oh yes. Great article. Look it up if you haven't. Um, it's also hilarious because it's like, how dare Facebook try to beat its competitors? And it's like, that's what you do in business. Um, um, so TikTok has done a really good job of like figuring out how to be ubiquitous on other platforms or like get attention on other platforms while also driving you to its platform. So TikTok kind of figured it out. I think it's both and. I think you want to use them and you want to win on your own too. I think the Post is like the only major newspaper on TikTok. It's kind of cringy. <laughs> yeah. Again, I, for an overhyped trend, I just do my BS sniffer again. Basically, if you talk to enough people who really know it, they're really smart people who are in the field and be like, do you actually believe in this? And they're going to say no, um, usually. So that's, it's like getting access to the people who are experts is, is a top way to do stuff. I think we might be out of time, but if you want to come talk afterwards, I'm super down. So, so thank you very yeah. much.